Welcome to this webinar on the latest developments in scholarly communication in 2018. Over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be covering a range of topics from copyright infringement lawsuits to the ongoing negotiations over access to journal content in Europe. We'll have time for questions at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to add them in the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen, and I'll try to pick them up as we go through. We'll start with something you may have read about in the professional press recently, Plan S. This was launched at the start of September as an initiative of the Coalition S Consortium of the European Research Council, and it's designed to increase the number of openly available research publications. The plan requires all research funded by participating bodies to be made available via an open access journal or repository after January 2020. The plan itself has 10 key principles, which you can see on the screen now. Obviously, that's quite a lot to get through, and we don't have time to cover everything in depth in this webinar. So I'm just going to highlight a few things. The plan doesn't actually contain that many changes from current practice, so we're just going to focus on what are likely to be the most contentious points for researchers. Authors will retain copyright in their publications, and these should be published under an open license. So under the current system, once a researcher has published their work, something like a book or a journal article, they need to seek permission from the publisher of that work in order to reuse it in their future projects, as they would with any other type of third party material. This is because when they published their work, they signed an agreement which transferred copyright in that work to the publisher. Although the author or authors would still retain the moral rights over their work, so the right to be identified as the author of that work, for example, they lose the economic rights, so the right to make money out of it, and the work itself becomes subject to the normal copyright restrictions and exemptions. This is often quite confusing for researchers and for some librarians as well, because as far as the research is concerned, they wrote this work, so why can't they then use it in future projects? I mean, it's their output. Why do they need to ask permission? However, this is um, the nature of copyright at the moment, and it's something that researchers and authors have to deal with under the current system. What Plan S would do is work to change all this by mandating that research outputs published with an open license, and it actually recommends a CC BY license, a Creative Commons Attribution license, and that's the most sort of open and permissive of the open licenses. This allows both adaptation and reuse for commercial as well as private reasons as long as the um, creator of the original work is credited, so as long as you say this work is by so-and-so. Although this would help to make things clearer for everyone that's involved, both the author and the person trying to use whatever it is, it would help develop um, the academic body of knowledge, allowing people to build on different things. There are some problems in certain disciplines with this recommendation. So, for example, those who work in humanities, arts and social sciences favour a slightly more restrictive licence, and that's probably going to be something like CC by NCND, which is a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives licence. And that doesn't allow derivatives, it doesn't allow adaptation in any way, or any commercial exploitation. This is because researchers in these disciplines, quite rightly, feel that their work is more about interpretation than it is about reporting a set of, sort of definite results. And they're worried that with a, an open license like CC BY, it, it's too too open in their interpretation and their work can be misattributed and their point can be lost and things can be said that they didn't say it can be twisted in some way. So at the moment, this is still very much an ongoing discussion. We don't have any concrete solutions for you. And a lot of work needs to be done on both sides to reach some kind of compromise that works for everybody, or at least as many people as we can. And even when that's done, the librarian community is going to have to work with the research community and advocate quite a lot to make sure that everyone is fully aware of both their rights as an author and what they could potentially be signing away and what the different licenses mean, how to license their work, that kind of thing. These next two points, the coalition members are going to work to establish a set of criteria for what an open access journal or platform is, and they're going to offer incentives for the creation of these where they don't exist. This has got some people worried because to create new journals and launch new platforms successfully, successfully being the key word, takes time, and some are worried that the 
January 2020 deadline is not actually that far away and it doesn't really leave enough time to do it properly. They're worried about it being a bit of a rush and a bit of a botched job. It's important to note that Plan S isn't saying that new platforms have to be created. We don't have to run out and do new ones and create new journals from scratch, only that they can be where they don't exist. And if you think about it, if you flip it on its head, this could actually be a really good opportunity to help any areas which have been struggling to create sort of true open access platforms. Maybe they don't have the time, maybe they don't have the level of investment. They can take advantage of this plan and develop something and actually finally take the plunge. Members of the coalition, instead of creating new things, will mostly be concentrating on setting out sort of the rules on what actually constitutes an open access journal or platform and making these clearer, both for researchers and for those trying to manage these platforms. Until now, it's all been a little bit murky, so this has led to some kind of dubious fringe practices, things like predatory publishing, which is when um, sort of unscrupulous publishers who are just out to make some money promise the researcher that they will publish their work, you know, it will be peer reviewed, but it's not actually peer reviewed and it, you'll get it out tomorrow and it will be great for you, but it's going to cost you X number of thousands of pounds. They call that an open access fee, but it's just a fee that they're paying to the publisher and they don't really get anything out of it as a researcher. So the lack of clear guidance has, has helped to develop those somewhat dodgy practices. And also it's led to the development of something called hybrid open access journals, which does lead us on to our next point. That these um, journals, they offer both closed and open content and not going to be compliant under the new Plan S rules. So this restriction on publishing in these hybrid journals has been on the cards for some time. And in many institutions, it's kind of already a fact of scholarly life. People are used to it. So when we talk about hybrid journals, what we mean are those which operate a traditional subscription model for access, but they offer authors a chance to make select articles openly available for a fee. So that will be an open access fee, article processing charge. So you would have the main body of the journal and then somebody wants to publish and they want to make their, their work open access, whereas everything else is, is held behind a paywall. They will pay the journal publisher quite a lot of money to do this. These open access fees can run into thousands of pounds or dollars. I think the average in the UK is um, 1,700, 1,800 pounds per article. So obviously this isn't something that everyone just can find down the back of the sofa. And this model has been criticised by both those in libraries and the research community because libraries, they're often bearing the cost or at least the administrative burden of these open access fees. And they're having to pay twice for access to the content because they're having to pay once for the open access fee and then again to read everything else that's in the journal. And researchers are understandably saying, you know, this is thousands of pounds, millions of pounds it adds up to, you know, this money could actually be spent on more research. There are better uses for it. So these last two developments have actually led to some concerns amongst the research community that they're going to be restricted when it comes to choosing where they can publish their work. And this is particularly true of those in disciplines where publishing in certain journal titles will earn you more academic credit than in others. And that's, that's quite a widespread thing. But understandably, they don't want the choice of where to publish taken away from. They want to be free to publish where they want to publish. In a Cambridge context, that's particularly important because Cambridge has a deliberate policy of not telling students where they should and shouldn't publish. So we don't like maintain lists of good journals and bad journals to publish in. What we want to do is offer them tools they need to make an informed choice. So rather than saying this is where you should publish, like, these are the considerations that you should take into account. So it's particularly important that we don't impinge their freedom in that way. However, it is really important to stress that it isn't necessarily the case. There's been quite a lot of scaremongering over this, but it, it should all be fine. There are these offsetting agreements in place with several of the different titles. So it might be that we get a discount on our um, open access fees or a lower subscription rate. Things will work out to help smooth the transition. And like the current system, authors are going to be able to publish in what they call the venue of their choice, so the publication of their choice, as long, and this is the crucial part, as they also deposit a copy of their author's accepted manuscript in a suitable repository under a CC by license with a zero month embargo. 
I've used a lot of words and terminology there, so I'm just going to unpick that a little bit. Authors accepting manuscript. What we're talking about there is the version of a manuscript, say a journal article, that the author has worked on. They've sent it off to the journal. It has been through perhaps two, three rounds of peer review and the journal publishers finally saying, yes, this is good. We're happy to publish this as is. That then goes off to the publisher and they will make it look pretty and they'll make it look like a journal article. At the point where it has been accepted for publication by the publisher, that becomes the author's accepted manuscript. So it might not look like a journal article, quite often looks like a word or other kind of document. The journal will take it off and typeset it, set it and copy edit it and make it look like a journal article like you would expect. And essentially the content in the two is the same. So it's, it's all to do with copyright, but the author's accepted manuscript is the version that's been accepted for publication but not yet typeset by the publisher. When um, it talks about a suitable repository in that statement, it's talking about somewhere that is going to store this output. And this can be an institutional repository like Apollo, collection of Cambridge research. It could be a subject specific one. It could be a discipline specific one. It could be something that's just widely used. So physics, for example, have archive as a repository that's quite widely used in that sector. It doesn't mean just uploading it online. There are very specific criteria when it comes to what is and isn't a repository. So repositories will um, exist to preserve output rather than make any money. So they will offer a persistent link. They will offer storage. They will offer persistent access, I think, for at least 10 years. It's not something where you just upload it and hope for the best. There are very specific conditions. And the next part of the statement, under a CC BY license, so that's what we touched on earlier, that's a Creative Commons attribution license, the uh, most permissive of all the open licenses. And then this needs to be done with a zero month embargo. So an embargo is when a work is uploaded to a repository. Sometimes it's not immediately viewable by the end user. So it might just be the metadata that's on there, it might just be the title, the abstract, maybe a little preview, um, who the author is, subject headings, things like that, what it's about. That kind of information is available, but the actual text isn't available for 6, 12, 18, 24 months, however long it is. Different journals have different embargo periods, different disciplines have different embargo periods. What Plan S is saying is it, it wants zero month embargo, so it wants everything available immediately. So just to run through that sentence again, what it's asking for is that authors can publish whatever they like, as long as they also deposit a copy of their author's accepted manuscript in a suitable repository under a CC by license with a zero month embargo. So whilst Plan S and reaction to it is all still developing, because this is all still very new, only came out at the start of September this year, more information is going to be made available, more debates are going to happen, you'll see blog posts and things crop up. So do keep an eye on the OSC blog, which I'll give you the link to, and our social media profiles, as we'll share sort of news and updates as they come in and as things change. So another story that you might see hitting the scholarly comms headlines recently has been this long-running contract negotiations between a publisher called Elsevier and various universities in Europe. So these negotiations have actually been going on for a number of years now, but they're currently stalled in both Germany and Sweden as kind of neither side is willing to budge. So Elsevier being a publisher who, you know, they want to further knowledge, but they also want to make some money. They want to raise their subscription prices and the universities and other institutions don't actually want to pay those higher subscription prices. So it's kind of been a bit of a, a standoff going on for a little while there. And um, whilst this standoff, has been happening, you know, whilst negotiations have stalled, and they've stalled for maybe two or three years. Obviously, old agreements have lapsed, you know, contracts have ended, universities aren't paying any more money, but Elsevier have kept access to their full catalogue going for quite some time whilst these negotiations have been happening, but that's changed. They've taken a tougher stance in recent months, and they've actually withdrawn access to the latest materials. So. 
different different license agreements and things like that, different subscription models, means that in Germany and Sweden, where this has been happening, scholars are finding that they can't access things from maybe 2016 onwards, but they can still access the older material. Obviously, depending on discipline, this can be a huge problem because uh, things like scientific disciplines, uh, things change really quickly and researchers do need that access to the latest findings. However, not all doom and gloom, important to say that. Librarians listening will know that there are various legal, and I'm deliberately stressing the word legal there, alternatives to accessing this material. So you've got things like interlibrary loan, preprint servers, or even if you're desperate buying access to individual articles, although obviously if you're doing a whole literature review that can add up at sort of $30, $40 an article. The negotiations as well have been used as something as a test case, so everyone's sort of sitting there with their popcorn watching how this is going to develop, who's going to break first, because the outcome will affect you know other people's contract negotiations and how they proceed in other countries, so it's quite a big deal. It's still quite early days, so I think um, access has only been cut off in the last few weeks in some cases, certainly only in the last few months. Reaction from the research community is mixed. Some people are you know, quite rightly outraged because they expect to be able to get these articles, the latest articles in their field, through their university subscription, and they're finding that they can't. But actually quite a lot of researchers kind of understand the library's position on this, and think that no, this is actually a good thing and we should be doing these negotiations because the money that's spent with publishers, which is millions of, of pounds, euros, dollars, could actually be better spent probably on their next research project. So there's people on both sides of the divide there. However, some people are turning to uh, slightly less than legal methods of accessing research and we'll come on to this in the next section of the webinar. So we talked about the problem, what's the solution? Under the current sort of big deal model, journal titles are bundled together and that makes them more cost effective for the publisher to sell. So you might have a few big titles in a bundle with some sort of smaller, more niche titles. Um, publishers argue that they do this as a way of keeping the smaller journals alive because it wouldn't be cost effective to publish them otherwise, their circulation isn't big enough. In practice, what this means for libraries is that they need to pay for a whole bundle of journals in order to get access to the ones that they actually want. And as publishing models change and more and more journals become niche, these bundles are getting bigger and bigger and then the cost goes up as well, which is obviously not something that's reflected in library budgets. So the New Deal suggested by University Consortia is something that would help keep subscription costs down through kind of collective agreement rather than lots of different individual deals. And they favour something called a read and publish agreement, which you might have heard of. And it's similar to something that was recently introduced by MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. So this means that authors at a participating institution can make their publications with that publisher openly available at the time of publication for free. So they can make them open access when they're published for free. The institution will then pay a subscription to access material that's not by its own authors, which isn't openly available, so is held behind that paywall. And the aim is that over time, this is going to result in more openly available content and therefore lower subscription fees. So to go back to the example of MIT and the Royal Society of Chemistry, when an author, corresponding author, publishes a paper with the Royal Society of Chemistry and they're from MIT, that is made open access upon publication without payment of a fee. MIT still has to pay the Royal Society of Chemistry to access everything else that's behind the paywall. Over time, if more and more publishers and more and more institutions do this, the amount of open access material will increase and therefore you won't need the subscriptions as much because more information will be openly available. Again, this is not a solution that's without its critics, so several people commented that these deals still aren't really transparent enough, so other libraries can't find out the details to make sure they get an equivalent deal. So, you know, if Harvard comes along and wants to make a deal with the Royal Society of Chemistry, they don't know if they're getting a better or worse deal than MIT, for example. And others have talked about the fact that these deals are still going to leave quite a lot of power in the hands of these traditional legacy publishing firms, these big publishing houses. And that doesn't really leave a lot of room for the newer, more innovative publishers to enter the market, disrupt it, mess things around a little. And of course, that's how you get change. 
there's also a problem that these deals do, it has to be said, financially benefit larger, more research intensive institutions such as Cambridge and not really the, the smaller ones that don't produce that much research. You know, they've still got to pay these, these subscription fees. So that doesn't really deal with the inequality issues that open access is supposed to help with. So again, you can see that this is still an area where there are lots of developments and we'll have to keep watching all these developments closely. Elsevier, a large publisher, they've got lots of popular titles, so other countries are sort of watching this with interest because this is kind of the test case to see how it goes and, you know, who picks first, what's going to happen. And somebody has actually commented that whatever happens in Germany and Sweden is going to be the de facto deal for the rest of the world, and I think that's a really important point to note. You know, it's not just happening in Germany and Sweden. What happens there will impact the rest of us. So it's worth keeping an eye on and worth being aware of. So we kind of touched on the issue of access to information in the previous section. You know, what does happen if research is cut off from the latest papers? Where do they go? <laughs> so as librarians, we, we kind of want to recommend, you know, nice legal solutions like interlibrary loan, looking for free open access versions online or, you know, contacting authors directly, doing some peer to peer sharing, which is all perfectly legal. But we know, you know, that there are other options that people out there are pursuing. It would be silly to bury our heads in the sand on this. The problem is that not all of these options are legal. And I think the main one that I want to talk about is Sci-Hub, something you may have heard of or at least come across. For those of you who don't know, Sci-Hub is a site which aims to make research papers, and they're usually behind a paywall, aims to make them freely available online. So it does claim to be doing this for noble reasons. They want everyone who needs access to these papers to have it, no matter what their financial situation. It was actually set up by a neurobiologist, I think she is, from Kazakhstan, who obviously, working in that kind of area, needed the most up-to-date research available was finding it quite hard to get budget-wise and she couldn't access these things, so she she sought another solution. Whilst the, the goal of the thing might be noble, so it, it's aiming to open up knowledge and research to people who need it, I do have to stress that it is illegal. It's the bottom line, can't get away from it. The model basically involves researchers and academics legally downloading articles through their university or institutional subscription, and then illegally re-uploading these to Sci-Hub for sharing onto a central server. So it would be someone from Cambridge, for example, coming along, logging into iDiscover, downloading the article, which they're perfectly entitled to do for their own research, but then taking that and re-uploading it somewhere else to share it with the wider community. So that's where the illegal part happens. The site's actually been shut down numerous times now, but it has got quite a lot of underground support amongst the research community, and it's moved to new servers. The whole thing starts all over again. Important to point out that publishers have definitely noticed this. Sci-Hub has actually been sued twice in the last three years for copyright infringement, and it's lost both times because it is infringing copyright. It's lost once to Elsevier in a settlement of $15 million and then to the Royal Society of Chemistry for $4.8 million. So quite a lot of money involved here, money which it hasn't paid as far as I know. The advice for librarians and any researchers that are listening is to avoid this site because the bottom line is it's illegal. We can't recommend that anybody uses it. It just don't. There are plenty of alternatives. You've got open access versions of material, you've got lots of institutional repositories around the world, you've got interlibrary loan, if Cambridge doesn't has, have access to something, there are options, basically. So this leads us nicely into this final section of the webinar, and you might recognise these names on the screen here. Elsevier certainly seems to be cropping up in the news a lot recently, it's not intentional, not picking on them in this webinar. But this time we're going to look at them in connection to copyright infringement, so kind of feeding off what we're talking about with Sci-Hub. Basically, Elsevier and other publishers have taken action, legal action, against ResearchGate for infringing their copyright. Really quick recap for those who don't know, ResearchGate is a social networking site for researchers where they can share details of their careers, their publications, what they're working on, that kind of thing. And most people use it to like, provide metadata or links to like, legally hosted versions of their publication. 
but what you can do is upload the full text to papers as well. So originally it was set up as a sort of way for researchers to connect with each other. A part of doing this is, is showcasing your work. So what people have been doing is saying, well, I've written a paper on such and such, here it is, here's the full text. Because it can be confusing and that problem we talked about earlier of people saying, well, you know, I, I wrote the thing, therefore it's mine, not realising they've signed the copyright away. The researchers are often unsure about the restrictions and even if they don't intend to breach copyright, they often do because there's lots of illegal uploads of papers, book chapters, presentations, lots of different things on ResearchGate. Just a few weeks ago, so as I'm recording this, it's kind of late October 2018. So just a few weeks ago, Elsevier and the American Chemical Society launched legal proceedings against ResearchGate in the US for copyright infringement. So they claim that articles that they published and therefore owned the economic rights to, the right to make money out of it, these have been legally uploaded to ResearchGate. They also allege that ResearchGate's kind of business model and their interface is making it far too easy for researchers to sort of accidentally upload copyrighted content and it even encourages them to do it in emails and other sign up options. So for example, if you think about if you ever booked a flight with Ryanair, you book your flight and that's one price and then before you get to the checkout it's tried to sell you car insurance and seating upgrades and baggage and chocolates for the flight and sandwich vouchers and all sorts of other things and it's all too easy to kind of click on the wrong thing and your total goes up and up and up. You really have to pay attention to what it is you're agreeing to. So as well as that, publishers are also alleging, alleging being the keyword, that ResearchGate is actually bypassing researchers completely when it doesn't work sort of to trick them into uploading stuff by actually scouring the internet for copyright content and then just uploading that to the site. So it's being alleged that ResearchGate know they're doing wrong and doing it anyway. The lawsuit is actually asking for a cease and desist order, the deletion of all copyright content and damages of $150,000 per infringed work and that would add up to millions. Still ongoing and a similar lawsuit was brought in Germany just last year and that's also still ongoing but ResearchGate as a result has taken down nearly 2 million papers from its site so I mean this is something that people are taking seriously. Whether the specific claims in this lawsuit are true or not I'm not here to judge but it is easy to illegally share content on sites like ResearchGate. Poor copyright education as much as anything else is at fault for this. Lawsuits like this one becoming more and more common and I think both researchers and librarians need to make sure they're up to speed on copyright so that librarians can offer advice and support and researchers can avoid accidentally uploading anything they shouldn't. I think quite a lot of the things that are illegally uploaded on sites like ResearchGate, it's, it's not for malicious reasons, people just genuinely don't realise. There's also that education issue that needs to be addressed on the difference between sites like this and what an open access repository is. So people will upload things to ResearchGate thinking that makes it open access compliant because they put it in a repository, but that's not the case. It's very specific criteria for what is and isn't a repository and ResearchGate does not fit that criteria, but we could go on about that all day as a whole other webinar. Another important thing to be aware of is that publishers are issuing takedown notices when they see copyright infringement. So if something is uploaded to these sites illegally then you can expect the takedown notice in the near future. If you do get a researcher come to you about this the important thing is not to panic. In 9 out of 10, 9.9 .9 out of 10 cases you take it down that's it there's no problem no further action taken so if that does happen just take it down move on. So that's about all we have time to cover in this webinar. It's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but I hope it has given you a flavour of kind of what's been happening in scholarly comms over the last few months. It is a time of a lot of change, as it always is in scholarly communication, and it can be quite a lot to keep on top of, especially if you're dealing with everything else as well. So on the screen, I've included links to our blog in the OSC, Unlocking Research Blog, and our social media presences, which I recommend that you follow for discussion on the latest developments and latest news. We try and condense it all down for you and make it easily digestible and give you a bit of analysis as well. 
So at this point, I'll stop and see if anyone has any questions in the chat box. If not, I will move on. Just give you a second. Doesn't look like anyone has any questions. But if you do, then these are my details. Please do feel free to contact me at any point if you'd like further information or if you have a question. There's no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to any of this stuff. Please just feel free to reach out and I'll try and do what I can. And thanks so much for listening.